Well, good evening to you all. You're very welcome. Um, I'm delighted to, that you're here um, and that you're here to enjoy um, the exhibition Crossing Cultures, which will be on to the Museum of Art until mid July. The first exhibition of Australian art in America um, was held in 1941. And the catalogue was highly esteemed. And the people involved with it were important. It was held at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It was organized by the Museum of Modern Art. The curator was the director of the Yale University Art Gallery. And the first page of the catalogue said as follows. Australia the terra incognita of the old world, the last continent to be discovered, is a study in variety and sameness. It has a hot, barren core, ridge after ridge of red sand, a desert of stones without water, then sand again. It's a con continent compacted and made strange by separation from the rest of the world for untold time. An island that has evolved by itself and grown old before the coming of the white men. It was the continent in which man had been unsuccessful. Scientific opinion is coming more and more to see in the aboriginals a run down and defeated people not defeated by a superior civilization as the Red Indians of North America were, but that by the continent itself before the advent of the white man. They're known to be an ancient race, yet they never learned to till their soil, never progressed. There are vestiges in their language and in their tribal customs of higher race memories. Their bodies present a riddle to which one answer is that they were once a white people, blackened through centuries by the sun, worn down by an overwhelming struggle for existence, a people defeated in the evolutionary cycle. <coughs> well, to our minds, that's pretty extraordinary. <laughs> the deep-seated racism the profound colonialism that drips from these words is a very different matter to, way, to the way that we esteem Australian Aboriginal culture today. And in all of our activities during this exhibition, Crossing Cultures, we pay respects in acknowledging that for Indigenous people bring their art to another land which was colonized, it's appropriate to acknowledge this fact. And so, before each program in this exhibition cycle, we say, we begin by paying our respects to the Kickapoo people and the Miami peoples of this region, of this area on whose lands the Toledo Museum of Art is built. And we pay tribute to their ancestors, uh, to their memory and to these peoples. There's a very big difference between that introduction and the introduction I've just read uh, to the catalogue of 1941. And indeed, we've moved on because in 1945, we had the International Declaration of Human Rights. The mid 20th century was the great era of human rights. And we are now in the era of cultural rights. We've just had the United Nations Declaration <coughs> of Indigenous Peoples and the importance of recognizing culture uh, throughout the world. Now, contemporary Aboriginal culture has reached a state of great prominence uh, in the world. And in the year 2000, um, it's a rather grainy photograph, but in the year 2000, uh, there was an exhibition in the Nikolai Hall. This is the throne room in which the Tsars of Russia were crowned. 
of the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. And the Aboriginal Memorial, which is the most important work of Indigenous art in Australia, 200 memorial poles, log coffins, that were created uh, in 1988 uh, to mark the bicentenary of Australia, that is to say the bicentenary of the colonization of Australia by the British in 1788. This work was the centerpiece of this incredible exhibition. Now the current show here in Toledo Museum of Art, Crossing Cultures, is an extraordinary a demonstration of the vibrancy of Australian Aboriginal culture. And last weekend, I was writing an article for the British magazine Apollo, which will come out in July. And it's a presage to an exhibition called Australia, which will be the biggest exhibition of Australian art, both indigenous and non-indigenous, ever to be seen in Britain. And it opened at the Royal Academy in London in the fall. And I was writing about American collections of Australian Aboriginal art. And the amazing thing is there are quite a few American collections that have more than 500 pieces of Aboriginal art. One of them is the Owen Wagner collection, of which 535 works have already been donated as a gift to Dartmouth College. And Will Owen and Harvey Wagner, who will be here with us next weekend, and Will will give, will give a tour with me at 2 o'clock next Saturday, that's not tomorrow. Um, they have actually several hundred more works in their collection. America's always been very, very quick to acquire works of emerging art movements. When uh, Claude Monet's haystacks were first exhibited in Paris in 1891, more of them were bought by American collectors than by French. And the reason is that American collectors very often study very hard and are, get great advice. And, and we're very fortunate in the fact. Now, the most famous woman artist from Aboriginal culture in recent times in Australia is Emily in Warrior. And she was a, the boss woman of her community in a place that was called Utopia, uh, near Alice Springs. And she passed away at the age of 80 in 1996. And in the last seven years of her life, she, she transferred the paintings that she created on her body and, and in sand painting uh, throughout her life as a senior law woman uh, onto canvas and made thousands of works like this one which is called Desert Flowers. And while these works seem abstract and many of the works do open crossing cultures, they are and they aren't. Because the Australian desert is not like the Arabian desert. It comes alive after the rains and extraordinary things happen so that you see a relationship between paintings and real life. And Emily was once asked, what did she paint? And she said, the whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole lot. That's what I paint, the whole lot. Now, in Emily's understanding, like for every Aboriginal person, the whole lot means that everything is connected. We're connected to the spirit world, to the land, each of us, to our country, to family, and to community. Now, Emily was born in desert country, Alcahar, and it was, it was on a cattle station which was, as I said, later called Utopia. It's in a remote corner of the Simpson Desert, which is the most remote of the Australian deserts. I once went down the Simpson Desert on the Colston Track with some friends of mine. It took a few days, going very, very slowly, um, in four-wheel drives. And we came upon the fashion that there is in very remote desert tracks in Australia, a stick uh, with a bottle on it. And in the bottle, is placed a piece of paper that tells you when the last person went by, which was four years before. <laughs> and the word utopia, um, it comes from two Greek words, which mean no place. 
the idea of being from no place, nowhere, no land. But the idea of suggesting that people come from no place is ridiculous. And the alternative meaning in Greek of utopia is wonderfully a good place or good land. And for Emily, her land and her country was everything. Australia was founded on a pernicious lie, a fallacy. It's the only country that was ever taken by another power on the basis of a total lie. And the law by which Australia was taken was called terra nullius, which is the idea that nobody lived there. It was taken and could be owned because nobody lived there, which wasn't true. It's believed that there were about a million people in Australia in 1788. And the Aboriginal population was decimated and reduced to about 60,000 by the 1920s. What's even more remarkable is that the connection of Aboriginal people to their land is the oldest continuous culture in the world, going back tens of thousands of years, perhaps 60,000 years. And Terra Australis, or the Great Southern Land, which was colonized from the 1770s when Captain Cook arrived, and then when the fleet arrived in 1788, is a country in which for two centuries Aboriginal culture was decimated and sublimated. Aboriginal people in Australia, because they were in a country where their existence was denied and presumed not to be there, did not get the right to vote until 1967. But far worse still, they weren't even counted in the census of population until 1967. So when you go to our exhibition, Crossing Cultures, you'll see some of the older people that will say that they were born about such and such a year, because the date of their birth and it was never recorded. Now the thing is that since the 1970s, indigenous culture in Australia has re-emerged with extraordinary vitality. It's been shifting, experimenting, developing, only in the manner of its expression, because the tenets of its laws do not change. The culture is strong because Aboriginal people have made it so. When Aboriginal people paint up, as it said, they are painting themselves to their country using designs that only their people can use because they come from a particular place. This is uh, Maisie Mappangardi, um, who is from a region called Lake Mackay. And here the ladies who are painted up are dancing up country. The idea of dancing up country. You'll see an extraordinary painting by Dorothy Mappangardi in the exhibition, and um, done by Kathleen Pachare. You see this, these little white spots on the paintings which are the marks of footprints, but also the marks of, this is the heel of your foot in dancing, are the marks of uh, the salt on the great salt lake of Lake Mackay, and particularly the effects that water has on it when it rains. A salt lake is an extraordinary thing to walk on, and a beautiful thing to see. Here's Dorothy. With, it, with her work, Salt on Minna Minna. If you know where she comes from, her work makes sense. Now the strength of Aboriginal people, despite this extraordinary history, is that Aboriginal people understand that their strength is found in the CAM Centre. So in Indigenous culture, the CAM Centre is the eye of a storm. If, I mean, if we want to go into the ancient classics of Western culture, it's about Aristotle 
and Plato. It's about order and chaos. We all struggle to have order in a world of chaos and in lives that will come to an end. And it's the camp centre that consistently feeds uh, fresh winds back into the storm. And the chaotic storm of Australia is the moral and economic and social challenge of the disadvantage that has faced Aboriginal people. Now, the former Governor General of Australia, Sir William Dean, uh, felt this profoundly. This ancient culture represented by young people who were challenged to take it forward. And Sir William opened the first exhibition uh, of my time as director of the National Gallery of Australia. It's an exhibition called um, The Wagalag um, Sisters Story. This is a great Aboriginal leader and preacher, Garwin Gumana, and at that opening ceremony in 1997. And the last exhibition of my time in Australia, and the art of David Malangi, one of the painters of the log coffins in the Aboriginal memorial that ended up in um, St. Petersburg, and which is now the major work which introduces people to the 11 galleries of Aboriginal art in the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. It was his exhibition that was opened by Sir William Dean. This is Gunmaringo and his wife, um, a work of 1961. There's a phrase in Latin, and I say this to you because it's important. It's important to understand the importance of indigenous people. The phrase is, qui tacet consentire videtur. What it means is, he who is silent is seen to consent. So some people say that things will soon be better for Aboriginal Australians, and that re reconciliation is already happening because the silent majority is in favour of it. But I personally hesitate when I hear the term the silent majority. Because sometimes, far from protesting too much, we don't protest enough. I met many people, distinguished Aboriginal leaders, uh, while I was in Australia in the eight years between 1997 and 2005. And so many of them carried the strength of their culture profoundly. Uh, this is one of them, Marsha Langton dressed in an extraordinary jumper. Uh, in Australia, what you call a sweater is called a jumper. But a kangaroo is a jumper. Uh, and a woolly jumper is obviously a woolly sweater. And this is called a kangaroo and boomerang jumper. <laughs> Christian Thompson uh, is one of the artists in Crossing Cultures. And uh, he's a Bidjara man from uh, South Australia. And the boomerang has been appropriated in so many ways. You'll see this in a work by Michael Riley uh, in the exhibition. And um, these <coughs> extra long sleeves, I think, can be interpreted um, as a, a form of never ending straitjacket. So the legacy of Aboriginal people blows um, constantly. In the 1970s, Aboriginal people made a decision. They made a decision to invite us to share their culture as a way of maintaining it. And that was the impetus towards a political change which has been huge. And people like the American collectors I, rep I, I mentioned have embraced that and brought it to us. Um, in 1988, there was an exhibition in New York uh, called Dreamings at the Asia Society. It was the first major exhibition of Aboriginal art in this country. And among the people who saw that exhibition were Will Owen and Harvey Wagner, who then started to make a collection that we now have on display. But that exhibition went traveling and it went to uh, the University of Chicago, to the Smart Museum. So 25 years ago, there was an exhibition somewhere in the Midwest. But we've never had one here uh, until now. And so the decision to engage works of art 
of Western form, that's to say, um, critics on canvas, for example, as here in the women of the Kunji, um, at Hass Bluff, uh, in uh, the central deserts of, of Australia, uh, near Alice Springs, they have engaged in this format to tell their story, uh, to tell their story um, as a reconciliation in one of the most extraordinary um, political peace movements um, that's ever existed. And wonderful people came out of this movement. This is the marvelous Queenie Mackenzie from the Kimberley region, uh, from Warman, Turkey Creek, um, in uh, Western Australia. And she defended her people and told their stories in extraordinary paintings. But she was describing a situation which is surely untenable. It's a situation of many indigenous peoples in this world where there, there are being extinguished by the ravages of many aspects of an impoverished lifestyle. The poorest community in America is the Native American community. And poor health and nutrition and alcohol and substance abuse and domestic violence. And the statistics are just shocking. I'll just say to you, more than half of indigenous men and about 40% of indigenous women die before they're 50. Um, Aboriginal people are seven times more likely to be murdered than non-Aboriginal people. The situation for Aboriginal people in Australia is very, very challenging. And yet, Aboriginal artists represent this culture in ways that call us to understand it, which we're being invited to do until mid-July now in Crossing Cultures, as we have for the last weeks. We're humbled by this representation to us. This is incredible work by uh, Rover Thomas, uh, also from uh, Western Australia, um, in earth pigments um, on canvas, so ochre on canvas, like the last room of our exhibition, um, which contains lots of works like these. And so the yellow gravel here uh, intersects this black bitumen highway that cuts across the red land. And so the invitation to us is to understand that the land was red. The issue of terra nullius is extraordinary. If you take something on the basis that nobody was there, then the law that you impose on that country must be triumphant. And any effort to try to claim that the law of the people who were there is nullified because you haven't acknowledged that they were there. And so since the 1980s in Australia, there's been a whole sequence of legal judgments. And so William Dean was the most prominent um, uh, judge in the Mabo judgment, which was the beginnings of a whole series of cases that have given Aboriginal people back their lands. Millions uh, of acres of land. Because unlike the United States or New Zealand in the mid-19th century, Australia never had a treaty with its indigenous people. Never had a treaty with them because it didn't acknowledge that they existed. Now, what sort of resistance are people going to use in that sort of case? And why the Australian Aboriginal art movement is one of the most extraordinary movements ever, but certainly the most extraordinary movement to emerge in the last quarter of the 20th century anywhere in the world is because the people decided to use art as political resistance. And this is what you see. You see it as resistance. This is work by Ree, which actually uses the color of the Aboriginal flag, uh, which was designed in 1971. Um, there are three colors. Black obviously symbolizes um, the Aboriginal people. Yellow represents the sun and red represents the earth and the ochre that Aboriginal people use uh, in, in ceremonies. So the ongoing framework that challenges us is that the philosophy of a colonizing people is that you assume that there's a dying race and that you'll breed them out and that you'll whiten them out in this case. 
And the first work that introduces you to crossing cultures is a work made with bleach, bleach on canvas. The artist's mother worked as a domestic worker and he always smelled bleach from her. But bleach uh, is a metaphor, uh, it's a symbol uh, for what was happening uh, to his people. So Aboriginal people have protested uh, for a long time and this exhibition is founded on this reality of this glorious art faced against this very, very challenging background. And it's just not possible to talk about Aboriginal art, I feel, without inviting you to consider the circumstances in which the works of art are made. In 1988, the Bicentennial of Australia was an extraordinary celebration for white Australia, but it was the beginning of National Sorry Day, here Invasion Day, and the invitation to consider what was there to celebrate and for Aboriginal people. The anthropologist um, W.E.H. Stanner, um, he implied in the title of the book that he wrote in 1979, that the response by Australia's indigenous people to their dispossession and persecution has been to demonstrate that we, white men, got no dreaming. And he took the quotation uh, from a man, a Murabata man, called Muta, who says here, white men got no dreaming, him go another way. White men, him go different. Him got robe belong himself. So the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the people who live in the Torres Strait Islands, are not featured in our exhibition, but it's the top corner of Australia, distinct peoples from Aboriginal peoples, but everybody on the mainland, Aboriginal peoples, um, and including the Tiwi Islands to the north of Darwin. Ever since the 1970s, they've tried to demonstrate their reality in another way in the way of art, uh, which challenges us and which invites us to celebrate what Emily called the whole lot. That's what I paint, uh, the whole lot. Or Polly and Gal, this bush plum dreaming, the whole lot. Now the importance of land uh, to Australia and to its indigenous people and their understanding of it uh, put them fundamentally at odds with non-indigenous Australians. Because the Aboriginal people understood Australia as a communicative um, place of hundreds of languages. And about 500 years ago, in this great planet Earth of ours, we spoke about 15,000 languages. Today, we only speak 6,000. And Linguists reckon that by the end of this century, this 21st century, about half of them will be gone. And for Aboriginal people, on the eve of European settlement in 1788, there were about 250 languages, but most of them have been lost now, and there remain about 50. And only 17 of these 50 are spoken by more than 50,000 people. So language is culture. Uh, it's a form of communication, and art is a form of language. Today, uh, there are about 550,000 Aboriginal people in Australia. Uh, that's about 2.5% of the population. And about 100,000 of them live in the deserts uh, of Australia. So only about a fifth uh, live in the deserts. And for all Aboriginal people, their culture is their backbone, as they say and their foundation and the centre of their culture. The land of Australia is harsh, dry and barren, yet rich and full. Full to markings that we can witness, which can be painted and can be danced. And the strength of culture has kept Aboriginal people strong in their storytelling, uh, in their object making, uh, in their painting. Because every indigenous person is an, is a, an artistic practitioner. <clears throat> non-indigenous Australia, like non-indigenous America, we tend to divide out the artists from the rest of the people. We even say, are you an artist? 
Whereas in indigenous culture, everybody's an artist. Because art expresses your life and your identity. And art is a way of passing on your culture to future generations. And the market for Aboriginal art has become huge, um, several hundred million dollars a year. Like every art market, only a proportion of it would be regarded as what we tend to call in museums, museum quality. Like every art form. And there are a lot of challenges to art making. There's a lot of purportedly Aboriginal art that's not made by Aboriginal people. It's made by others. And, and so therefore, I encourage you, if you're interested, and you can do a lot of this on the internet, that you buy from Indigenous-owned art centres. Queenie Mackenzie, um, the Gija woman uh, from Warman, or Turkey Creek, um, that I referred to earlier, passed away in 1998. She was a spokesperson for her people. Um, and her people uh, struggled greatly in the 1980s to try and stop their ancestral lands from being destroyed by the great mine, the Argyle Diamond Mine, which was constructed on their lands. And she claimed that only a small number of her people had actually agreed to it. What she said was, then those mining people came and they didn't ask us. That's the way they started in the first place. They never asked me or any proper boss of this place. They only asked a few and some of their family went down to Perth and they signed that paper. We didn't know that they went down and signed it. Then they come back and tell us all to give it to them. All right, we go and look. We went up there, up near the rock hole. We go along near that spring. We look at that spring. Now ah, look, look what they did to our place. This is where the women used to camp for spinifex. And so it was that the holes were blasted in the ground of this great ancestral place, which was the land of the Barramundi dreaming. And Queenie was very hurt. And she said, as she could only say so beautifully, we all really sad, I tell you. We woke up that road and we can see those stones where that fellow, that Barramundi, this is sad, I tell you. Well, lately, no, I haven't fe been feeling right. When we saw those miners, we must go straight up and say, you know, you're supposed to let us know about the women's sacred place. We come and stop you right back, all those old women, since the dream time, looked after that place and kept it safe. Now it was our turn and we failed. It makes me strange and sad inside. For Aboriginal people, the story of the world is a creation story which is called the dream time. And in the dream time, ancestral beings created everything. They came over the land and as they sang over the land, the land was brought into being and the people were brought into being and the animals were brought into being. And every place of which they passed became a place of that being. And so you have a Baramundi dreaming and a caterpillar dreaming and a honey ant dreaming and all of these places are distinct places. And if you're from that place, you are of the honey ant dreaming. And that is your totem and that is your dream. And it's for all time. So the difference between the dreaming and dream time. In the dream time is in the creation time. But your dreaming is now. Because Aboriginal people believe that the past and the present and the future are all happening at the same time. There's no concept of time. Time is all one. It's the whole lot. And one of the most striking instances of making a determination around this idea was this extraordinary painting that was made in 1996 in the great sandy desert of Western Australia. It's an absolutely enormous painting called the Nogura Canvas. Um, the people from Arnhem Land, the Yolnu people, had made deeds of title using bark paintings to claim their land because they weren't people who wrote with letters. They wrote with pictographs and with imagery that told their story. And so they came to the parliament and they asked for their land back, uh, trying to stop the world's biggest bauxite mine from being built at Yerkala. Uh, and, and they failed. But the Nagura painting uh, allowed the people from the Great Sandy Desert to all come together and mark all their living waterholes, all their jila, so that they could claim their country. And the area being claimed by this painting, it's a big painting, is 3,000 square miles. 
3,000 square miles of desert. And what the artist said was, if white people can't believe our words, they can look at our painting. It's the same thing. So the painting was a way to overcome uh, the language barriers. Now, all this calm center of wonderful art making that we see in this exhibition um, has been supported by the Australian government by the introduction of rights of resale royalty. It hasn't been introduced in America, and it's unlikely to here. Europe has introduced a dry suite, as it's called. This gives you the right that in ongoing sales of your work, after you sell it the first time, you get a proportion of the, the price given back to the, to the original maker. And the highest prices at auction for Aboriginal art have become extraordinary. In 2007, the National Gallery of Australia, where I worked, um, paid uh, $2,400,000 uh, for a painting by um, Clifford Possum Japajari. One of the original artists of the Papunyan movement in 1971, which started this extraordinary renewal of Aboriginal painting. And Aboriginal designs are in so many places. All this making that people have decided upon, all gathered together, has given this resistance and this political power. All of the works in our exhibition, except the photographs in the first part of the exhibition, were made on the ground. Not on an easel, on the ground, giving this extraordinary map like geographic quality of description of the land uh, to all of the works. And all of these markings are places, particular places. So it's not abstract, it's real. Some of you may have travelled on one of the three Qantas Boeing 747 jets, which have been painted by um, Roz and uh, John Moriarty's studio, uh, Ballerinji. And there's a blend of Aboriginal design that's impacting culture. So if you walk into the, our exhibition, Crossing Culture, you can have no idea that's also a whole other side of Aboriginal art and culture. And this is the way that Aboriginal art has affected, for example, design. This clearly also a take on the Aboriginal flag by Harold Thomas from 1971 uh, that I referred to earlier. But it implies that the dress weds the bearer to the land. <coughs> and this is by uh, Robin Coughlin, uh, who was an uh, Australian Designer of the Year uh, in 1990. And this is a ski suit by Jimmy Pike uh, and Doris Gingara. Uh, and this resulted uh, in a license agreement with Desert Designs. Uh, and uh, the manufacturer by, um, some of you will know, Rakarala, the Japanese firm, um, to manufacture high-performance ski wear with Aboriginal designs. Um, and this design is a rainbow serpent image here in the back. Or in swimwear, a snake and eggs design. Um, and Aboriginal music um, is probably the strongest way that you'd appreciate Aboriginal culture today if you were in Australia. There's famous Sydney-based singer Jimmy Little here. Um, or in the world of rock music, um, Yothu Yindi and uh, Mandawa Yunapingu here um, made Aboriginal music and culture famous. So some of you will know um, that when we were going to get a 70-foot um, saltwater crocodile in Toledo Zoo, um, I was concerned that because the crocodile is a very great totem, uh, of the people of Arnhem Land, that we would consult the right of the people there uh, to know that we had this crocodile, because it's not an American crocodile, it's an Australian crocodile. Very, very large one. And so um, I went um, to our curator of crossing culture, Stephen Gilchrist, who put me in touch with Will Stubbs, who's in charge of the art community at Yerkala, who put me in touch with Mandawai Yumapingu, who has the rights to the crocodile dream. And he said, we could call this crocodile Baru. And they'd be honored if we call this crocodile Baru. And we did respect to them by asking them. And he did offer, if we wanted, that they can come here and christen it. <laughs> and this is the Fender um, Stratocaster that uh, Yotha Yindi band members um, used, um, which had the original flag on it. And lots of music. This is a, a pop band uh, um, which had a whole series of, <coughs> of singles, um, Simone Stacy and Naomi Wenaton, 
um, singer-songwriters. They're from Queensland, from Cairns, as it said. And the annual Indigenous Music Festival is called the Deadly. Uh, when you say something in Australia is deadly, you mean it's absolutely fantastic. It means it's super cool. <laughs> And this is um, the extraordinary uh, Australian Indigenous Dance Company, Bangara. If you ever have a chance to see them, do. They're totally preeminent and uh, they have taken the world stages um, by storm. There's a performance which you can appreciate is called Fish. And the whole idea of a corroboree, a gathering, a performance um, here, um, fusing traditional uh, dance uh, with world dance uh, and world music. And then throughout Australia is a whole indigenous radio network that sees people uh, using satellite and telephone technology. Long before I ever saw in a white school in Australia, I saw Aboriginal people um, <coughs> using the school of the air, just as there's the um, Royal Flying Doctor Service, using little cameras on top of their computers to receive classes from remotely from a teacher in a city elsewhere in Australia. Australia um, is extraordinary. No matter where you are, you can make a phone call. Um, the effort to um, bring broadband across the entire continent makes it look embarrassing for other countries uh, not to have done it. Um, and uh, it's the only way you can tackle a country the size of America um, where only 23 million people live. So I want to show you now um, uh, what happened on February the 13th, 2008, when finally an Australian Prime Minister uh, decided uh, to apologize uh, to Aboriginal people. Paul Keating, the Australian Prime Minister in the 90s, he had uh, made a wonderful speech at the Aboriginal community in Sydney called Red Fern, it's called the Red Fern Speech. Um, and uh, he went a long way, but his successors, especially John Howard, decided not to make an apology, and many prime ministers fear this, that making an apology is to express regret um, in a formal way for the sins of your fathers, and we're not responsible for them. Others feel, yes, we're responsible for the legacy of our past, and we need to acknowledge it. And Kevin Rudd, Prime Minister of Australia, on February the 13th, 2008, uh, issued an apology. It was an apology particularly to the stolen generations. And in Gallery 18 upstairs, Nelson's Director's Conference Room, there's a series of prints that was made for the, it's called the Bicentennial Portfolio, made in 1988. This is one of the prints by Sally Morgan, um, which is a print um, which tells the story of um, the stolen generations. Taken away, it's called. Between 1909 and 1969 in Australia, Thousands of indigenous children were taken from their homes in their communities and brought to urban centers as orphans to be given to families and into institutions in an effort really to whiten them out and to civilize them so that Aboriginal culture would go away. And these are called the Stolen Generations. There's been a major parliamentary report in Australia about them. And so Kevin Rudd's apology was an apology uh, to the stolen generation. Today we honour the indigenous peoples of this land, the oldest continuing cultures in human history. We reflect on their past mistreatment. We reflect in particular on the mistreatment of those who were stolen generations, this blemished chapter in our national history. The time has now come for the nation to turn a new page, a new page in Australia's history by righting the wrongs of the past and so moving forward with confidence to the future. We apologise for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on these our fellow Australians. We apologise especially for the removal 
of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities and their country. For the pain, suffering and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants and for their families left behind, we say sorry. To the mothers and the fathers, the brothers and the sisters, for the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry. And for the indignity and degradation thus inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture, we say sorry. We, the Parliament of Australia, respectfully request that this apology be received in the spirit in which it is offered as part of the healing of the nation. For the future, we take heart, resolving that this new page in the history of our great continent can now be written. We today take this first step by acknowledging the past and laying claim to a future that embraces all Australians. To the stolen generations, I say the following. As Prime Minister of Australia, I am sorry. On behalf of the Government of Australia, I am sorry. On behalf of the Parliament of Australia, I am sorry. And I offer you this apology without qualification. We apologise for the hurt, the pain and suffering we the Parliament have caused you by the laws that previous Parliaments have enacted. We apologise for the indignity, the degradation and the humiliation these laws embody. We offer this apology to the mothers, the fathers, the brothers, the sisters, the families and the communities whose lives were ripped apart by the actions of successive governments under successive parliaments. So let us turn this page together. Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, government and opposition, Commonwealth and state, and write this new chapter in our nation's story together. extraordinary culture and to expose you and all our visitors uh, to that culture. Um, last Friday um, I looked at the cards that visitors had filled in for this exhibition for the previous four days. There were 209 of them. 205 gave five out of five uh, to this exhibition with three four out of fives and one three out of five. <laughs> That's a tribute to the extraordinary power of these works of art, which I invite you uh, to go to see now. And this beautiful bird that connects us through these extraordinary log coffins from Arnhem Land passed into the works of acrylic on canvas from the deserts and especially Papania, and then through to the fish in the far right here from Arakoon and the Cape York Peninsula in the northeast of Australia into the back room, into the Kimberley and out of the exhibition. Take you on a journey of a song line uh, throughout Australia. And we've placed these memorial poles on islands so that you can walk on water and take yourself through this extraordinary <coughs> exhibition and have deep regard uh, for Aboriginal people. I showed you Christian Thompson's long sweater, kangaroo jumper, and he also makes this, made this work which introduced <coughs> you to the show. 
And in this work, he captures a lot of what we've been talking about. He shows this young man himself, just a self-portrait with a hoodie. So threatening, in a way, young man, don't see his face. But in his face, we see instead the black gum eucalyptus. All its flowers falling and hiding his face. Because when Aboriginal people were not counted in the census, they were included instead under the Flora and Fauna Act. And so today we use, in regard to Australian trees and flora like this, we call them Australian natives. And so Christian Thompson proclaims himself an Australian native and invites you to see the exhibition and to walk that tour of Australia. So I encourage you to see the show many times uh, before mid-July to bring people to see it. You know, you're not going to see something like this very often. I hope in this uh, talk I've given you some foundation to understanding the extraordinary vitality, uh, the great vigor and determination of resistance, but also proclamation of culture, uh, which is spoken through this exhibition. Uh, I'm very proud that uh, so many people are enjoying it and, and celebrating the thoughts around indigenous culture in this country and elsewhere. So thanks very much for listening, and please go enjoy the show.